That's exactly why Labour resisted the legislation that we passed to crack down on this madness. Because thanks to our new laws, the police can now get these clowns off our streets and get traffic moving in a matter of minutes. The Prime Minister and I are firmly on the side of the law-abiding majority. That's why we've backed our police officers with one of the largest ever rises in police pay. It's why we ensured we hit our target of 20,000 additional police officers, so that we now have more officers in England and Wales than ever before. It's why we've backed the police's use of stop and search as an effective way to get knives off our streets. It's why we secured agreement from the police to investigate all burglaries and follow all reasonable lines of inquiry when someone reports a crime. And it's why we've reformed hate crime guidance so that officers aren't wasting hours investigating squabbles on Twitter. It's why we're making sure the police are not inadvertently helping mobs to enforce non-existent blasphemy laws. And it's why we've prioritised tracking down grooming gang perpetrators and getting justice for their victims after authorities turned a blind eye. It's why we've made sure that Prevent, the government programme that stops people sliding towards terrorism, is focused on the main security threat to the British public, Islamist extremism. And let me take a moment to recognise that in all of this, we have been assisted by some truly excellent police and crime commissioners who share our commitment to common sense and law and order. There is so much more to do, and the public knows that. But Labour certainly won't do it. There's more to do to reform our vagrancy laws because we cannot let British cities go the way of San Francisco or Seattle. There's more to do to ensure that foreign national offenders aren't clogging up our prisons for less serious crimes, but are booted out of Britain as soon as possible. There's much more to do to end the scandal of rapists and paedophiles changing their names to evade sanctions and criminal record checks. And so, we will bring forward legislation to prevent registered sex offenders from changing their identities. We will work to strengthen background checks so that they can catch undisclosed changes of identity. Let me tell you something. I don't care if anyone thinks this is interfering with their human rights. It's time to worry less about the rights of sexual predators and more about the rights of victims. I want to thank the Safeguarding Alliance for their tireless campaigning on this issue. And let me go on and say this. I have a particular message to those brave police officers who risk their lives, risk their lives to protect the rest of us by carrying firearms into situations where they could be harmed or even killed. You are the thin blue line. You have our support. We are grateful for the vital work that you do day in, day out. And that's why I announced a review to report to me by the end of the year to ensure that the legal and operational framework in which they operate is robust and commands the confidence of both officers and the public. And to those who ask whether Labour can be trusted to fight crime, I have a two-word answer. Sadiq Khan. <laughs> if 
there's any justice in this world, Susan Hall is going to wipe the floor with him in May. They've already started the character assassination against Sue. The distortions, the insults, the lies, because that's what the Labour Party always does. It prefers smears to debate. Now, personally, I take their abuse as a compliment. <laughs> I know they've tried to make me into a hate figure because I tell the truth, the blunt, unvarnished truth about what is happening in our country. And I know, I know there are some who think that emphasizing the importance of law and order or secure borders is unedifying. They look down on those of us who care about such things. Of course, they are entitled to their beliefs. But let's be honest, these are luxury beliefs. What do I mean by that? Our politically correct critics have money, they have status, they have loud voices. They have the luxury of promoting seductive but irresponsible ideas, safe in the knowledge that their privilege will insulate them from any collateral damage. The Luxury Beliefs Brigade sit in their ivory towers telling ordinary people that they are morally deficient because they dare to get upset about the impact of illegal migration, net zero, or habitual criminals. And you can be sure of one thing. People with luxury beliefs will flock to Labour at the next general election because that's the way to get the kind of society they want. What is that? They want, and they like, open borders. The migrants coming in won't be taking their jobs. In fact, they're more likely to have them mowing their lawns or cleaning their homes. They love soft sentences because the criminals who benefit from such ostentatious compassion won't be terrorizing their streets or grooming their children. They're desperate to reverse Brexit. They think patriotism and embar is embarrassing and have no use for their British passport unless it's taking them to their second homes in Tuscany or the Dordogne. For these people, I have a simple message. You are entitled to your luxury beliefs, but the British people will no longer pay for them. There's another reason I think we will win the next election. You see, we have a secret weapon. Well, not that secret. Everyone in this hall knows it. I think everyone who will be at Labour Conference knows it too. And our friends in the media definitely know it. Our secret weapon is Sir Keir Starmer. <laughs> You see, the British people have no enthusiasm for Sir Keir Starmer. They know that he believes in nothing. They know that he will say anything to anyone and then change his mind at the first sign of trouble. Keir Starmer lacks the personality to lead this country effectively. Imagine, imagine what would happen if he became Prime Minister. Luxury beliefs would reign supreme. Britain would go properly woke. Things are bad enough already. We see it in parts of Whitehall, in museums, in galleries, in the police, and even in leading companies in the city. Under the banner, under the banner of diversity, equity, and inclusion, official policies have been embedded that distort the whole purpose of these institutions. Highly controversial ideas are presented to the workforce and to the public as if they're motherhood and apple pie. Gender ideology, white privilege, anti-British history. And the evidence demonstrates that if you don't challenge this poison, things just get worse. Whole institutions become captured. And of course, as always happens when the left gets the upper hand, 
Those who fail to conform are persecuted, chased out of their jobs for saying that a man can't be a woman, scolded for rejecting that they're beneficiaries of institutional racism, disciplined for using the wrong words. This conservative government has begun the task of clearing out this pernicious nonsense. The British people will get to decide if they want to curb woke with Rishi Sunak or let it run riot with Keir Take the Knee Starmer. <laughs> Labour is the party of pressure groups, rich zealots and trade union activists. But you know, the Conservative Party, the Conservative Party is also a kind of trade union. Because we are the trade union of the British people. And I think we should adopt as our motto these lines from the poet Shelley, which I'm shamelessly taking back from Labour. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. You are many, they are few. We stand with the many, the law-abiding, hard-working, common-sense majority <coughs> against the few, the privileged woke minority with their luxury beliefs who wield influence out of proportion to their numbers. Our message to the people is clear. We are raising our game. We are fighting for a Britain that puts you first. We are on your side. Thank you.